Okay, so I'm assuming you all read the um, uh, the notice of prep, and so, but we can get into that if you have questions, you know, or if you wanted to dig into any of those sections, but I'm going to give sort of a high level overview of what our approach to growth and development is and some of the reasons why we're planning for this at this point, kind of the trends we're seeing on the horizon as, uh, uh, you know, driving our growth and development. So last update, major update to our general plan was in 2020. That was a comprehensive update from our 1989 general plan. Um, and we are preparing a general plan for the next 20 plus year cycle, uh, shooting out to 2045. Uh, with this update, there are several uh, new components to it. There's a gateway area plan, and I'll uh, point to you in a little bit more detail uh, where that area is located. We're doing a community plan for this specific area to try and uh, streamline development in the gateway area. <clears throat> Within several of the uh, elements will have minor updates, you know, they're listed here. Um, what we anticipate in these minor update sections is you know, updates to become consistent with state law, updates to uh, language to address, you know, our uh, commitment to uh, racial equity, um, changes to, uh, you know, figures to, you know, to update current data, um, that sort of thing. But we're not seeing overall major changes within these various sections uh, because we believe that they still reflect very closely uh, the community's values and the community's which wishes. And so those will have uh, very minor updates. Um, the sections that we see will have major updates include the land use, um, transportation and circulation, public facilities and infrastructure, and parks and recreation. The first three primarily because that's where the uh, increase in population base will be felt. Uh, and then the last is because our parks and rec element didn't, uh, it got short shrift in our last update um, it's, it's literally still, um, if not typed, it's on a dot matrix kind of printer uh, format. So um, that's, that's in desperate need of an update. We do have a Parks and Recs master plan that's, um, you know, given us some updated information on that. So, so those four elements will have uh, comprehensive updates. Uh, we just adopted our housing element that's going to go into the new uh, general plan as is. And many of you are familiar with the housing elements uh, are updated on a, a regular and periodic basis. Uh, currently we're on eight-year cycle. So no change currently in this update on the housing element. Um, I'll also note that not included here and not addressed in this EIR, we are updating our local coastal program. And so the uh, coastal land use element uh, will also be updated uh, through a side process, you know, separate process through that local coastal program update. Um, some of you may know that uh, local jurisdictions have a statutory exemption for LCP updates. Uh, the state does not have that, that tool at their disposal. And so the state, when they review certification of our local coastal program, they will be conducting the uh, environmental review for that. So these are the subject areas. Um, before I move on, um, just wanna open it for discussion. Are there is there anyone who has, uh, you know, feelings that some of these areas where we've suggested minor updates, uh, we should actually be considering uh, more substantive or, or comprehensive updates? Okay. Hey, Tamara, um, just seeing now that you jumped on the call. Do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm late. I'm Tamara Gedick with the Coastal Commission um, here in the Arcata office, and um, I'm the supervising planner that um, is primarily responsible for Del Norte County and uh, City of Trinidad um, and City of Crescent City. Um, our, our planners in our office are all assigned by geographic areas. Um, however, I anticipate that I'll be um, helping out at some point in the process with uh, City of Arcata's uh, local coastal program update. And so I was curious to hear about the general plan update today and how it is interrelating with the city's um, LCP process um, and to, to what extent um, any of the items that are being discussed today may be um, overlapping with um, or 
being addressed separately in the LCP update. So I'm um, just happy to um, have the opportunity to hear about what the city is um, undertaking right now and look forward to opportunities for more dialogue um, going forward. So thanks. Great, thanks. And if you wouldn't mind, Tamara, popping your uh, contact name and affiliation and contact information into the chat so we have a, a record of who attended today. Will do. Thank you. Okay, uh, so just super high level uh, primer on you know where we're at in the city currently. This is our current land use map. Uh, there are a few few minor updates that have been made that this map didn't track, but for the most part, you know the the point I'm trying to make here is what our land use distribution looks like. Um, we'll zoom into the lower portion here, and you can see that you know that's dominated by the big green parcels. Um, those are ag lands uh, and or the lighter color uh, yellowish greens and, and light greens, mint greens are uh, low density, very low density um, uh, residential, intended to be a transition between uh, you know, the, the public lands or the uh, resource lands and higher, uh, uh, higher density uses. Um, and then the yellow are residential low density um, and the red is our core downtown. Uh, the brown colors are um, higher density uh, developments. Uh, so then scooching up to the north side of Arcata, you can see the uh, purples and pinks um, are industrial lands uh, and uh, the browns are again higher density residential and then the orange is sort of our commercial visitor serving uh, zoning district. So this is kind of our current distribution of land uses um, and you know the city has had uh, these these boundaries roughly with few minor additions. Um, we did an addition of buttermilk uh, through an annexation a couple of years back because there were failing septic systems out there. Uh, we did an addition an annexation uh, on the far north here to add Boyd Road and a property that was uh, Eureka Ready Mix that was you know, hoping to annex in and, and you know, take advantage of, uh, you know, sewer. Um, and just recently, uh, back in uh, last year, oh, I guess it's not on this sheet. Uh, we had, somehow I missed it on both sheets. Oh, here we go. Uh, the annexation of uh, Creekside, which is this brown parcel here. And so for the most part, the city's boundaries have been relatively stable uh, you know, over the last 20 years uh, with very minor uh, annexations uh, of, of properties for very specific purposes. And the city's current general plan has a, an emphasis on infill development. Uh, when the city's general plan was adopted, there were you know, several uh, what we consider vacant and underutilized parcels uh, that were ready for development uh, and that stock of properties that were you know committed towards either economic or uh, residential uses uh, remained in our books over the last 20 years over that over the course of that time uh, especially for residential properties we've nearly built out we have uh, according to our last housing element 351 residential units left to build in the city of Arcata before all of the properties are completely built out. Uh, and that's not to say that we wouldn't have some additional development from accessory dwelling units, um, you know, or SB9 subdivisions, but that uh, the majority of, of, you know, raw property for new subdivisions or, uh, you know, uh, building on existing subdivisions that have vacant land, uh, the city is basically done with that. And so this new general plan does envision, um, you know, adding new residential and uh, economic development uh, stock to the property base, but it does not plan to do so by uh, amending city boundaries into the planning area. The red boundary here shows the city's what it considers its planning area. It goes up Jacoby Creek, uh, where we own some some prop some forest land properties, but for the most part. Um, the city's contiguous boundaries are, you know, around the bay to Mad River and then from the bottoms up into the hill slopes a little bit here in the dotted line. So we're doubling down in this next general plan cycle on the infill policies that we had um, specifically to 
um, you know, preserve those those green spaces, you know, and for all these other reasons. Um, and I'm sure, you know, I don't need to explain to this group uh, why uh, infill development is a superior option for meeting our future growth and development needs. Uh, but if you do have questions, I can go over those. Um, so currently, oh, interesting. So, okay, so currently, uh, and th this table is slightly dated, it's straight out of our general plan, but um, so the acreages have changed a little bit, but it's still reflective and representative. Currently the residential properties uh, in yellow here and uh, commercial properties in light green uh, can have residential development on them. Um, in general, uh, industrial and agricultural natural resources, public facilities don't generally support uh, uh, residential apart from maybe a caretaker. So part of our plan for, you know, meeting this infill development need is to take uh, some industrial lands and move them into, uh, you know, commercial mixed use, move them into residential uses. Uh, and in part, we would be looking to upzone properties that are currently residential low or medium uh, in higher densities. Uh, and then we also want to take a second look at our policies and provisions for residential development in the commercial areas where we think we can attain higher uh, densities uh, and potentially uh, generate some redevelopment within those commercial areas. And so note, all of what we're talking about here to meet the next 20 years worth of growth demand is about infill. That's the entire strategy here is infill. We expect to experience growth throughout the city. Um, here's sort of a summary. Those vacant parcels that I told you about, you know, would accommodate about 11% of the growth, projected growth, um, you know, depending on the growth uh, uh, projection. This is one, one projection. Uh, the Creekside project, the recent annexation is about 3% between, you know, natural ADUs and lot splits. We're getting 14, um, the gateway is 16, uh, and then those additional up zones that we'll look at, you know, 17%. I wanted to note here that the university uh, is planning, uh, you know, significant growth over the next 10 years, uh, and they are also planning for a significant increase in their housing. So on and off campus housing will accommodate uh, approximately 33% of the total uh, growth in, in housing development over the course of the next 20 years. So let's take a quick look at what we said we were going to do in the housing element, which was adopted in 20, at the be beginning of 2020. Uh, we knew we didn't have enough residentially zoned lands to satisfy the 610 units that the state um, or the, the, the local process, local arena process allocated to the city, we had about 350. And so we knew we needed to do some up zones. In our certified housing element, we identified these core areas. So I'll just walk you through these real quick. The south part of the city, we have the uh, gateway area plan and uh, downtown where we plan for densification. The gateway area planning process, uh, these are the final boundaries on it. Uh, they go from Samoa, capture some of the commercial properties uh, on the frontage of Samoa, some of the residential properties uh, east of K Street, and then the bulk of it is all of this industrially zoned property. So right in between the core downtown, the residential on one side, the residential on the other side, we have this relic, uh, you know, from, from our distant past, our, our never to return distant past uh, industrial uses. Um, and so a lot of these sites, you know, are potentially brownfield sites that, you know, aren't great to have in an, uh, you know, residential setting, we'll be going through and cleaning those up. The idea is transform this uh, gateway area into a high density mixed use zoning district. The uh, gateway area plan will become an element of the general plan. And then the underlying line zoning uh, will uh, uh, take place of the existing zoning in that area. I want to note too, here's the coastal zone boundary uh, that runs through the city. And all of this south of that line is included in the coastal zone, including a portion of the gateway area plan. So the intent at this point, and that, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, these are, these projects are on separate timelines. Uh, the intent is to attempt to adopt the local coastal program 
uh, without the gateway um, area plan planning, but then to come back afterwards and do a, um, an amendment to incorporate the gateway area plan when it's adopted, um, that planning depends on uh, timing. Um, we also have in the middle here, the Craftsman's Mall, St. Louis Road area. Uh, we had, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, the group that came and proposed uh, uh, student housing, the village project on the Craftsman's Mall several years back. Um, at that time, we identified this area as potential for higher density growth. And so this, would probably, this area will probably just be a rezone to residential high density. Uh, many of you may know that the Craftsman's Mall is now um, owned by the university and they're going to, uh, they're actually going to build the village um, project or something very similar to it. Uh, and then a far, in the far north, we have the Valley West area, um, which has, uh, you know, some commercially zoned properties and, and some, you know, large sort of, uh, you know, uh, car-based uh, you know, development patterns out there. Uh, we'd like to see something that mirrors a little bit more like the, the um, downtown and uh, near downtown, the gateway uh, planning in this area where you'd have higher density, uh, more walkability, more human focused design. In addition to those areas that we identified in the general plan, I apologize, this one you can't see very well, but there's an area that is just inside the coastal zone uh, between 27th Street sphere and west of Alliance, uh, where we have some residential very low density properties and some residential low density properties uh, that could create significant housing stock if this were upzoned. The Planning Commission's recommended we do that. And so we're looking at whether this should be RM or RH zoning designation. And then in the uh, near downtown, we have North Town area, commercial district in the North Town that's again, smashed between residential districts. Uh, this is a prime area that could have, you know, densification of housing units. So we're looking at uh, a tweak of the zoning that would allow for that density. Okay, so what's, what's driving this? Um, is, is sort of a big question. If we look back in the last 20 years, so going from 1990 to current 2020, uh, census data, you know, we see uh, an uptick, you know, a steady increase in population. Population is the blue line. So let's focus on that for just a second. Uh, between 1990 and 2000, we had about, uh, uh, you know, 1,000 thousand, uh, people added to the city's population. Uh, it was an annual average of about, you know, 0.6% growth. Uh, you can see growth tapered off for a number of years between 2000 and 2010. We added about 500 people in that census uh, decade. And then between 2010 and 2020, you can see a significant uptick, in particular since 2017, uh, increases um, year over for each of these periods. And we ended up with closer to 1% growth over this last 10 year period, about 0.95 or 96 or so. Interestingly, uh, HSU's uh, population, this orange line, uh, kind of mirrored uh, HSU's headcount is on the, the right hand side here. So these aren't on the same scale, but they're proportional. HSU's growth rate kind of mirrored the city's growth rate, which leads me to believe that, you know, especially in the early 2000s, uh, our population growth was largely tied to the university's population growth. But then you have this disconnect uh, between 2017, when there's a precipitous drop off in uh, the student body and a precipitous increase in the population. So this is, this is kind of a canary in the coal mine for us. Uh, I just wanna draw people's attention to this because HSU is not going to stay at these levels. They're not going to stay at the, you know, under 7,000 level. They're projecting getting up to about 11,000, plus they'll have new faculty and staff that come along with that. And so as those people move back into our area, you know, the, the housing units that were absorbed by this new population growth here uh, is not going to be available for them. And so we need to, you know, plan for that. Okay, real quickly, what are the drivers of population growth over the next 20 years? We've got climate change. Uh, the coast is going to see significantly less uh, increase in temperature, uh, risk to fire, all those kinds of things. 
And in fact, our little uh, neck of the woods is truly an oasis. Uh, you know, housing costs right now, the average housing cost is in the 650, 750 range throughout the state. Uh, in Arcata and Humboldt County, it's more in the 450, 550 range. Uh, telework, uh, this is showing that after the pandemic, you know, significantly more people were working remotely and we hear every day that folks are, are uh, thinking about leaning that way permanently. And the fact that, um, you know, there's a growing uh, 65 plus population bringing their resources from other parts of the state, other parts of the country that can, you know, then buy into, you know, our relatively undervalued at this point housing stock uh, and settle down. So they're, they're going to be a driver, maybe a minor one. But then we've got all kinds of economic activity going on as well. The uh, Harbor District is going completely uh, full tilt with, you know, the wind project, the fish farm project, um, you know, all kinds of economic development on the peninsula. We've got the, you know, the Trans-Pacific trans uh, fiber net, uh, cable that came through and we've got, you know, all the economic activity that's going to generate around that. We've got the Polytech that's growing. I didn't even put the Polytech on here. So what does that mean, those drivers to population growth? If we look at our last 20 year planning period, uh, which said, hey, let's let's plan for 20% growth. We didn't quite hit it. We almost hit it, but we didn't quite. We had a depression in the first 10 years, a significant uptick in the last 10 years. So we could plan for 20% again if we wanted to. That would get us to you know about 23,000 people. Uh, just for kicks and giggles, if we doubled that and said, hey, let's go 40%, you know, it gets us to just over 26,000 people uh, in that 40, four, uh, 20 year planning period. But I wanted to look at what would happen, you know, with a couple more more uh, metrics, and there were reasons behind that I'm not going to get into, uh, you know, generating these uh, these uh, you know additional levels. But I tried 46 and 54 percent as well, 54 percent getting us uh, close to 29,000 people in total. And then I wanted to, you know, basis in you know some sort of a uh, fact check, if you will. What what could I use as a fact check? So I took uh, HSU's projections through the Polytech because that's the only one that has published data right now of all those climate drivers, you know, people selling out their homes and moving here, climate economic refugees, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Those we know are going to happen, but we just don't have numbers associated with them. The HSU Polytech we know um, has numbers associated with it. And so if we said 60% of the new population associated with polytech growth between now and 2030 when they plan to hit about 11,000, 12,000 students. You'll see that that in and of itself uh, gets us to almost 26,000 people, 25,500, let's say. Um, that's with the background 1% uh, growth rate that we've experienced over the last 10 years added into it as well. So those two things are, are potentially conflated. That's one of the things that we're trying to work through right now to hone the uh, uh, hone this model. But using that one percent growth rate and the HSU's growth, uh, you know, that gets us to this between forty six and fifty four percent population growth. So the the take home message here, and that's assuming that only sixty percent of the people that uh, you know, come to HSU, want to continue to live uh, in, the, in the city of Arcata, there may be a higher proportion that actually wants to live here. I clearly don't think we could handle the entire, uh, you know, student body uh, in the city of Arcata, and I don't think that's in HSU's plans as well. And so we're, we are planning for some of uh, that uh, growth to be absorbed into the county. So, you know, taken together, um, you know, I think that uh, projecting a 20% or, you know, even probably a 40% growth increase uh, is a little bit like burying our heads in the sand and saying that we don't want things to change. Um, if HSU is successful, and I, I think they will be successful, uh, we're going to see a growth curve that mirrors closer to, you know, 46 to 54%. And, um, you know, I certainly don't want to speak for HSU and, and you know, assume that, uh, you know, what they will do, but uh, it seems clear to me that if the community doesn't meet the housing uh, needs, uh, you know, into the future, 
there are certain entities and agencies that will you know take it upon themselves to to meet those needs okay so lots lots more population growth than anticipated in the past we don't know exactly what we're projecting yet at this point um, this model still needs to be honed a little bit um, to to land somewhere, but I, I think that we're going to be targeting something upwards of 40% population growth. Okay, so switching back gears to the the scoping part of this, uh, you know, from that background, the areas that we think we're going to see potential uh, CEQA impacts, you know, include these. They're described in detail in the notice of prep, um, but we you know we anticipate uh, in you know at least these types of things that we're going to be looking at uh, in real close detail. 